Good morning, everyone. It's Russ Barkley. Sorry to be running a little late this morning, but first of all, it wasn't until this morning that I actually found enough research this week to talk about. So apologies for that. Also, you notice that Johnny's back. Yep, he's my skeleton's crew in the studio this week. Ha ha ha. And uh, obviously trying to get some work done before he gets deported, which seems to be the happening thing here in the U.S., but let's start out, as always, with our dad jokes. Today's dad jokes come from the website safetyfirst.com, and I think they're pretty good. Uh, here's one I've heard before, but um, I actually like this one as well. I spent a lot of time and money and effort childproofing my house, but the kids still get in. <laughs> Reminds me of the other joke, which is that my partner and I have decided not to have children. The kids are taking it pretty hard. <laughs> All right, your next one up is, why is it a bad idea to iron your four-leaf clover? Because you shouldn't press your luck. <laughs> All right, last one up here. Here we go. What do you call a beehive without an exit? Unbelievable. <laughs> Think about it. Okay, that's enough of that for today. Let's take a look at the five articles I was able to find as of this morning. And I think most of them are pretty interesting. One of them is actually rather foolish, but we'll talk about that in a moment. First up is a very nice review uh, that comes to us from Psychological Science. Uh, and this is, uh, excuse me, it's not a review. It's actually a very large study, my apologies, that involved 19,000 Twins and 2,100, actually more than that, sibling pairs. This study was reported over in Psychological Science, uh, and it's a not just a large study, but a very good study looking at the co-occurrence and causality among ADHD, dyslexia, and dyscalculia, which is a math disorder. And what the study found is that while there was a high rate of comorbidity between these conditions, running upwards of 20 to 23 percent comorbidity, which is about two to three times greater than we see in the general population. So nothing surprising there. But while they do co-occur, they are not causing each other. That is to say, ADHD was not found to be causing dyslexia or dyscalculia, but instead what the paper found is that there is shared genetics among these disorders, which explains why they occur together more often than in typical children. Now, keep in mind, about 77% of the kids with one condition have that condition only, and that's typical of ADHD kids as well, not just kids with dyslexia and so on. So I, I thought a very nice paper that was able through various statistical procedures and using these twins and siblings to sort out the extent to which having one disorder led to the other in some causal fashion or whether there is an underlying shared genetic liability. And the answer was the latter shared genetic liability. So fascinating paper there I thought you might like to hear about. Next up is a study that was reported over in the Journal of Athletic Training. This is a fairly large study on the difference in recovery times in adolescents who suffer sports-related concussions if they have ADHD or not. So they're looking at the impact of ADHD and recovery times in these high school athletes that suffered concussions. We already know that people with ADHD, teens in particular, have a high rate of accidental injury and a higher rate of sports concussions than typical teens do. What this study is looking at is, does having ADHD affect recovery time? And they looked at recovery time as what they call recover to learning, that is, how many days before they were able to get back to typical levels of learning in the classroom, and also how many days did it take for them to recover and return to sports 
participation. And they used a sample of 935 high school students that had experienced sports-related concussions. Among them, they found 78 had self-identified as having ADHD or been diagnosed with ADHD. And so what did they find? They found that the ADHD group took significantly longer, that is, more days to return to learning than the non-ADHD group. The difference was about 11 days. That's rather striking. They found that it took about 13 days for the ADHD group to return to learning while it was just one and a half days for the non-ADHD group. Now, when they looked at return to sports, there was a significant difference, but it wasn't quite so striking. They found that when it came to the mean number of days it took to return to playing sports for the ADHD group, that was about 20 days. For the typical teenagers, it was 18. So about two and a half days to three days longer to return to playing sports. Interesting that it was longer to return to sports playing than it was to return to learning. Uh, overall, they found that females took longer to recover than males, regardless of whether they had ADHD or not. Uh, and they also found that at least when it came to returning to sports, younger age was a factor. That is, the younger the individuals, the more quickly they returned to playing sports, at least as I read these data. But I did want you to understand that having ADHD does appear to result in a longer time to recover from sports-related concussions. Okay, nice paper there. Let's move on and take a look at a very large study from Norway on sex differences in self-reported ADHD symptoms in both clinical and population-based samples. So this paper is looking at three very large data sets collected in Norway, totaling more than 100,000 cases. And what did they find? They found that males and females, of course, reported significantly higher symptoms of ADHD if they had ADHD, that's no surprise. But they're also going to compare males to males and females to females with the disorder. And they found that the differences between females with ADHD and typical females was significantly larger than what we see between males with ADHD and typical males. What this shows is that females experience a more severe level of symptoms relative to other females than do males. And this might explain the findings that we've seen earlier that females report experiencing impairment from their disorder at even lower levels of symptoms than do males. Or to put it another way, it takes more symptoms of ADHD for males to report being impaired than females. So, uh, it, and it may have to do with the fact that females seem to experience a more severe form of ADHD, at least in these samples. Now, bear in mind, this is self-reported symptoms of ADHD, not symptoms reported by others or, or symptoms as uh, detected in clinical evaluation. But thought that you might want to have that paper available on sex differences in ADHD. Moving along, this is a paper that was reported over in the journal Pediatric Research, uh, and it is yet one more example of the situation I've talked about repeatedly on this channel of people inferring causation from a correlation. This is a study of eight, excuse me, 184 children with ADHD in China and it's looking at the relationship between ADHD, child IQ, mother's education, and screen time. How much time the child spends on the screen. And they found that individuals with 
higher IQs, less screen time, and greater maternal education had better cognitive functioning on their cognitive assessment battery, which is just another term for an IQ test. So uh, no surprise that there are correlations here among these 184 patients with ADHD. But they then go on to conclude, here we go, that parents should reduce screen time in their ADHD children to improve their cognitive functioning. Well, wait a second. It could just as easily be that children of lower cognitive ability are more likely to spend time on screens than kids of higher cognitive ability. So it could go either way. And yet the authors want to interpret this as somehow evidence that families need to intervene with screen time to improve cognitive functioning. Well, I'm all for intervening on reducing screen time. Don't get me wrong about that. But to infer here that it's going to improve cognition is simply not possible from the results of this study. So yet one more example, seems endless, doesn't it? of people drawing causal conclusions from correlations. Okay, we're gonna wrap it up this Saturday with our final paper, which is a systematic review and meta-analysis of the various comorbid psychiatric disorders that occur with ADHD. So we're looking at the rate with which individuals experience these other disorders if they have ADHD. And the authors were able to identify 121 different studies involving nearly 40,000 children and adolescents with ADHD. So this is a big meta-analysis. And here's what they found. The most common disorder associated with childhood ADHD was oppositional defiant disorder. Nearly 35% of the individuals with ADHD had that as a second disorder. I'm not surprised by that. If you've seen my lectures on ODD on this channel, you know that ADHD predisposes to ODD. The more severe the ADHD, the greater the likelihood a child's going to develop oppositional disorder. And the rate of ODD is markedly higher than in the general population. And this study certainly finds that to be the case as well. They also found about 31% reported other behavioral disorders besides ODD. About 18% had anxiety disorders. Another 11% had specific phobias. About 11% had difficulties with enuresis, that's bedwetting. And about 11% had conduct disorder. Again, these figures of elevated comorbidity are not surprising. We've seen this repeatedly in many studies, but being a meta-analysis, this pulls it all together and gives us some pretty reliable rates of comorbidity in children with ADHD. Now, I do want to point out that the paper did not focus on learning disorders. And as I've already reported in the first paper this morning, I discussed learning disorders can occur in 20 to 30 percent of kids with ADHD. So that's a common comorbidity as well, even if not discussed in this paper. All right, everybody, that's it for your Saturday Research Roundup and Dad Jokes. Hope you enjoyed them. Say hi to Johnny back there. He's earning his keep. Hopefully we can keep him around the, uh, the studio for a while. And as always, if you're not a subscriber, think about subscribing to the channel. We've got over 162,000 subscribers as of this morning, and I am absolutely flattered and overwhelmed by the interest that people have in ADHD science. Also, let me tell you, if you know of anybody who could benefit from the information on the channel, please recommend it to others. And finally, as always, live well, be well, take care, and bye for now.